Hey there, Internet. Welcome to another episode of the Rocket MSP podcast, the show where we ask the vendors the tough questions. Today, I'm not joined by a vendor. I'm joined by another MSP. His name is Oren, and Oren is the co-founder and CEO of NetSureIt. Is that the right way to pronounce it? Perfect. Perfect. I like hearing that. Um, Oren, you you have a really fantastic achievement, man. I, I did a little bit of research, and you were you were listed in the Inc. 5000. Yes, yeah, that's um, that's fresh, uh, fresh news. Uh, so yeah, we were listed the second year this year, and um, yeah, it feels it it feels great. Uh, really, really grateful for that recognition. Well, very cool. Now, where are you located? Uh, I'm in South Africa right now, but I'm kind of between New York and South Africa. Okay, so where is Net Shore? Do you have offices at both locations? Yeah, so we have offices in Manhattan, uh, Mawa, New Jersey, Kenilworth, New Jersey, Maine, Brunswick, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa, and Durban, South Africa. That is so cool. So, so you are a real we have international teams. company. Yeah, we we actually have we actually have a, a part of our uh, innovate offering. We have uh, some of our team is in Poland. Uh, we have uh, someone in our marketing team in Peru, and then we also have some. We have some people in Philippines as well. Um, but we kind of really embrace this uh, work from anywhere, remote work uh, dynamic. Whereas before the pandemic, we were like totally in office, and now we've just really the, embraced this work from anywhere. I love that. All right, so today we're going to talk about um, a fun little MSP growth hack. I'm calling it. Uh, we're going to talk about scaling through acquisitions. And I assume that's, that's one of the most successful ways that you've scaled. Otherwise we wouldn't have this conversation together, right? Yeah, sure. So, um, it is, so we leverage both organic and acquisitive growth, but definitely the, um, the acquisitive growth has really accelerated our growth. All right. So. So you said that's accelerated your growth. So I, I was going to ask you, what are the main advantages of scaling through acquisition compared to organic growth? You know, just going out and uh, marketing and selling your your products and services. But um, I, I know obviously when when you acquire a company that, you know, suddenly you've got a big boost to your overall revenue because you've just acquired all their revenue too. But you've also got yes. a big cash outlay too, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, so I think there are a few parts that are quite interesting here. Look, I've, I've been doing this my whole adult life. So if I look at when we kind of arrived on, you know, the space in the market we were focused on and what we were going to do, that happened in 98, 99. So it's, I've kind of been doing this for over 20 years. So I'm essentially doing the same thing. It's just evolved and, and changed. So if you go back 10 years, maybe five years even, it was much easier as an MSP to find customers. It wasn't mm -hmm. quite as competitive as it is today. So, uh, the, you know, and I think from a strategy perspective, uh, if you look at the life cycle of the MSP industry with the amount of NS MSPs that are out there, it's become in strategy terms, what's called a red ocean where everybody's, you know, everybody's saying they're a great MSP, they're doing great cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really part of the dynamic of why I think MSPs owners are looking at potentially uh, having a liquidity event or selling their business to potentially have another chapter in their entrepreneurial journey. Organic growth is harder than it's ever been, I believe. It's more expensive. Uh, a lot of these MSP owners are early 50s, late 50s, even early 60s. So they're thinking about how do, how do you, you know, sort of, take some chips off the table and have a liquidity event, uh, you know, to realize the, the, you know, the fruits of what probably was a big chunk of their adult life. And, and then I think there's, if you look at AI and what's happening there, Steve, uh, it's both exciting. So if it, it, it's quite daunting to think, how is this, this rapid acceleration of AI 
going to impact the future of the MSP space. I think there's excitement and uncertainty there. And then there are, I don't know how many MSP uh, platforms, how many private equity firms have entered the MSP space to consolidate. So when you have so many MSP providers and they're at a certain maturity, it, it brings about um, consolidation in the market. And that's, that's essentially, I think, what is driving um, the, the M&A side of the MSP space. And then on the organic growth side, I can get into some of the things that we've done, if you wanted to, to achieve low double-digit organic growth. Okay. Now, one of the things that I, I think is a little daunting for MSPs is, you know, there's that whole chicken or the egg, right? What comes first? Finding the company that you want to acquire, uh, just just knowing that you want to grow through acquisitions, coming up with the, the seed money that you need to be able to acquire a company. Um, the list goes on, right? So yes. is, there, is there like a, a proper order to do this? Yeah, sure. So... The, you know, when we, I moved to New York in, in 2016 and, uh, that, that was precipitated by us doing our first acquisition in, in the U S we bought a business in Brooklyn. Um, we made every mistake you could imagine Steve, except got out of business. We have one member of that team left, uh, oh, wow. out of what was over 20 people. Um, the revenue shrank. Over two to three years, uh, we we it, it was it was rough. Uh, we funded it out of out of our own sort of cash reserves, um, and uh, it put serious pressure on our cash flow. Make no mistake. But look, we learned we learned really valuable lessons. So that was 2016. So 2017, 2018, 2019, we're fighting for survival. The business is shrinking. Um, uh, we we really really struggled, and we made a lot of mistakes. Um, we were arrogant. We thought we had all the answers and uh, we didn't deal with things in the, in the right way. And then going into 2019, uh, looking at the end of 2019, going into 2020, we decided to lean into the acquisitive growth again. So, and, and it's been relatively successful since then. So what did we do uh, in that time? We cut costs quite radically. They freed up budget for us to be able to invest in acquisitive growth, actually make funds on a monthly basis uh, available. So we went out and we found um, a buy side advisory firm. So we pay a monthly retainer. Depending where you're at, they're anywhere between five to $7,000 a month to retain a buy side advisory firm to find you opportunities. Uh, and uh, some of them will actually not only find you the opportunities, but they will do the due diligence, they will get it to LOI, and they'll take it all the way through to close. So it's kind of five to $7,000 a month. And then someone in your leadership team needs to say, this is going to be a big part of my day job, or ideally, it will be my day job. So I'd say find a, find a buy-side advisory firm and invest in that. Uh, someone in your team invests in uh, at the time to focus on it because it takes a lot of time and then you need additional members of your team to support you as and when the deal go comes in and then thirdly I would say is make sure you find a, a lawyer or a law firm that has had actual deal experience that you can bring in um, at the right time so if I look in the first deal we got the law the legal side of it right in many ways but we over lawyered it uh, massively. So we spent more in that deal in 2016, Steve, on legal fees than we had spent in the entire business combined over the last oh, five. So it was just in a pure state of ignorance. We just realized that we need to pay for good legal advice and we did, but there are, there are hacks and approaches you can do to not minimize, but optimize the, the, the legal piece. Um, so yeah, again, I would find a buy side advisory firm. I would, um, uh, I would have someone in your team that you, that you feel has the ability to do this, uh, dedicate some of their time. And then I would find a good 
a good law firm to support you because stuff can go wrong in these deals. Those are just three things. Um, there's a lot of other elements to it, but those would probably be off the cuff, the three key things I would think of. Now, you've mentioned a couple of um, things that I don't know that every person listening will, will know what you meant. So the first one, you said red ocean. So there's the concept of red ocean and blue ocean where yes. uh, red ocean is, it's, it's like there's blood in the water. There's lots of competition. Uh, yes. So yeah, MSPs, we're, we're all basically red ocean. There's, yes. there's, there's like 50 MSPs within a, you know, 10 mile radius of, of just about anybody. Right. Yes. Um, the other thing that you said was LOI, that's a letter of intent. So, uh, right. that means that you intend on purchasing the business. So I'll, uh, I'll probably pop in and just define some of these things as, as you say yes. for, for the people that are listening that maybe haven't, haven't heard these things before. Um, and in bar side advisory, sorry, I should also, uh, um, sure, bar side yeah. advisory is a, is a firm that you pay a monthly retainer to, and they will, they will do the outreach and find MSPs that are open to having a conversation. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, that that answers my next question, which was, how do you identify potential companies? You, you're you basically, you've got a company on retainer where that's their job. They find companies to acquire for you. Yeah, we've actually got two companies on retainer that are finding us opportunities. And then wow. what has happened as well is because we've been kind of focused on this since 2020, um, we are starting to get some word of mouth where we have people saying, look, I think you should talk to NetSureit. These guys really emphasize their people and their culture, um, you know, so where that's resulting in some word of mouth. And then there are investment banks out there that you can simply reach out to and say to them, I am looking for opportunities. This is roughly what I'm looking for. If you come across anything, let me know. So we closed an acquisition in May in Maine that came to us through an investment bank we didn't have a retainer with. Then, that it, then we also have another opportunity in LOI, a letter of intent, as you said, um, uh, that we're hoping to close in either October or November. That also came through an investment bank. So I think it's kind of just putting your feelers out there, but the buy side advisory is, is, has been the most reliable way of getting opportunities in the pipeline. And maybe I'll add one other point. The more opportunities you have in the pipeline, Steve, the more likely you are to make good decisions mm -hmm. because what can happen is you meet, you meet, you, you get into your first opportunity and out of inexperience and excitement, you, you, you maybe uh, ignore some of the red flags or some of the warning signs. But if you've got three or four in the pipeline, you automatically start to compare and sort of work out, okay, this is a better fit. This is not a good fit. And, and yeah. I want to clarify that, you know, my audience are typically smaller MSPs. Um, many of yes. them are sub $1 million of annual gross revenue. Um, a okay. quick Google search shows that NetSure is pulling in excess of $100 million a year of gross revenue. I don't know how accurate that is. You don't have to respond on that. That's fine. No, it's not. Our, our revenue is about $40 million. <laughs> Okay. So at, at $40 million, you you spending let's round up and go crazy a quarter million dollars on uh buy side advisory firms i mean we're we're talking less than one percent of your gross revenue on yes. on looking for growth opportunities so while it yes. sounds like a boatload of money like holy crap this guy's spending five thousand to seventy five hundred a month on two different firms it it really isn't when you realize the the scale of net sure it and um you, you know the you know just the resources that you have available to you yes no 100% and and maybe if i just kind of think about the, your audience and the demographic and kind of the one thing that that i have seen uh, we haven't experienced it directly but where you have um, MSPs that are in, a, in peer groups of a similar demographic, and let's assume there are three MSPs that are, that are all kind of, 800, let's say $800,000, okay, mm -hmm. as an example. 
So now you've got $2.4 million worth of revenue. They know each other. They, they share similar values. One alternative can be how do we merge our three businesses? One person handles operations because that's their strength. Another person handles sales and another person leans into the acquisitive growth. So now you've got a little bit more economies of scale. You leverage maybe some of the savings, maybe you consolidate into one office, uh, or, you know, and, and, and you leverage some of that to potentially invest uh, in, in finding acquisition opportunities. And that's a fantastic way of looking at it. I know that, you know, in the past, um, the idea of merging or selling the business, I know that that seems counterintuitive, especially, especially when you're, when you're still small and you're still trying to grow, right? Yes. It seems counterintuitive, but, but you, you hit the nail on the head. The, what it allows you to do is really start to focus, hyper focus on, uh, in, instead of a mile wide and an inch deep, you're an inch wide and a mile deep. And now you're going to become really, really good at just one facet of managing the business. You're still, yes. you're still going to be, you know, a stakeholder, shareholder, partial owner. If you merge with one or two other MSBs yes. and, and you, you know, you're, you're still going to have uh, the perks of that, right? But now you don't have to do it all yourself. You get yeah, to partner it. up with the leadership teams from these other MSPs as as you start to merge and and then eventually start to acquire other companies. Yeah, that's it. So think about it. If you love, you know, you, like we, we meet with the MSP owners all the time. There are some inspirational leaders and entrepreneurs in this MSP space. Like I tell mm -hmm. you now, very seldom do I meet with any MSP owner that doesn't, I don't learn something from or doesn't inspire me in some way or another. And now, you know, so the thinking is hypothetically in that scenario, you love the operations, you love the automation in our space. Now the base under you is triple the size. So now you can have fun because that's what you love. From a sales perspective, you've suddenly got a little bit more marketing budget. You may be getting more leads. You can cross sell into a bigger customer base and you can upsell that customer base. And then for the person that maybe leans into the M&A, you know, this is, I've, I've gone through a whole nother chapter of growth in, in my life as an MSP entrepreneur where I'm, I'm having fun. And, and I've, I, look, I'll be honest, I've always had fun. And mm -hmm. there've been some years that have been tougher than others, but I think it's, um, I saw such a great post from, from a, a guy I really admire. I got to know him through Microsoft. And he just, he, he said, one of his mentors said to him, don't, don't be too, you know, so sometimes what you find is we can be myopic. This is my role. I'm the CEO. I'm not going to do anything else. But if we adopt a gro growth mindset and say, well, I have a natural strength in sales. Why don't I lean into that more? And you know what you could do? You could all have, you could have co-CEO titles. Because as a salesperson to have a CEO in your title is good, to in an M&A role to have CEO in your title is good. And you see that sometimes. So different ways of looking at it. That's wonderful. Now, when looking at companies to acquire, um, there's, there's a lot of things that you need to analyze and assess. You have to look at their books. Um, you know, you have to make sure that, that you're, you're, you're not going to be completely, you know, surprised when you take over a company, but you yes. also have to look at their company culture. Um, yes. So which one's more important, the books or the culture? Our culture st it has to start with the culture, in my opinion, Steve. It has to start there. And, the, you know, like if I think, if I think more about the demographic of your audience, you could almost park the bar side advisory and just lean into the peer groups. Because in mm -hmm. the peer group, and so many MSPs are in those peer groups, right? And there's peer groups for every size of MSP. You get to know these other guys in the peer groups, the, these other people, and you can feel their values. You can listen to how they, how they, how they, uh, what their culture is like. You can look online. And you know, in those initial meetings and, and getting to know each other, you'll get a sense if there is a similar a perspective on culture and culture is just, it's huge. It really, really is huge. And I don't think there's ever an identical culture. So I think if, the, if there's enough of a connect and there's enough of an alignment of the foundations of the culture and then be open-minded, especially if you're merging, 
into almost a new and evolved culture. Uh, and that's something we've had to open our mind up to as well. Hmm. Now, have you ever acquired a business that they were smaller? You know, they, they didn't have the revenue. They might not have the uh, EBITDA or profit margin or whatever you're looking at. But for one reason or another, they're better than that sure it. Yeah, for sure. We bought, um, we bought a business in 2021. A uh, company's name is Evoke, and they have um, uh, uh, they have Microsoft Power Platform skills, SharePoint skills, and some Dev skills that were just at another level. And um, and and so we we took uh, we took that team and we built a managed service around it. Um, so we we would not have been able to build that managed service without them. And I mean, even if I look now. We're contemplating, so, you know, I, if I look, if we close the two acquisitions we have in the pipeline now, it'll put us on 50 million in revenue. And we're in the early phases of discussions with a business that is about $20 million in revenue. And it's not to, to boast or brag about the amount of revenue. It's more just a case of smaller business. I can tell you now, if we end up doing this deal with that $20 million business, there are many things that they're better at than us. And, you know, when you're growing fast, it's the ego starts to dissolve and it's just about who's the best leader, mm -hmm. who's the best, you know, at that part of it. So we would, we would let them lead us on a, on a good few, on a good few areas. Now, how do you maintain service quality and customer relationships during the integration process post-acquisition? And so a key part of our thesis, Steve, is that we want the leaders to stay. We don't want them to leave. And we believe that from a people perspective, the, the, you know, the Marcus Buckingham wrote that book, First Break All the Rules, where they surveyed like 80,000 companies and a million staff. And the one major insight they came out with was people work for managers. People work for managers before they work for companies. So you could be in the AI department at Google, okay? And, and if your manager is an asshole, and you can't see a way of getting around that, you will probably leave. You could be working for a small 10-man, 10 10-person 10 business, and your manager inspires you, you're going nowhere, you know? So, so that, that dynamic of retaining the key people, the key leaders, is, is for us a non-negotiable. In that, you can retain most of the good people. If you can retain the, the, the good people, we believe you can retain the right, the good customers. There's always some churn, not always. Sometimes some people move on. Sometimes some customers move on. That's just the dynamic of the MSP industry. But so our key sort of anchor is to hold on to the key leaders and have them join us on the next ch chapter of the journey. Now let's let's talk about that for a second because you know when when many MSPs think about selling their company, it's typically because they're looking for an exit strategy. So, you know, maybe they want to retire or maybe they're just sick of being an MSP. Um, how does that, how does that factor into your desire to keep leadership on board? Do, do you, do you typically try and keep the, the former owner on board or do, have you found that sometimes the upper management or executive level people are, are more like stuck in their ways and unwilling to change and don't want to do things your way kind of. Yeah. So I, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. I think if you're an MSP, okay. And, um, and, and you're, you're wanting to, to consider, uh, uh, taking some cash off the table. I don't say sell your business because I think, I think it creates the wrong perception. So firstly, if you want to sell your business and leave, you are guaranteed to get a lower value. It's guaranteed. No question about right. it. That's my opinion. There might be exceptions where they've added the salary back into the profits and included that in the valuation and they, they have someone in the region, so they're, they're exceptions. But in general, if you're going to leave your, your MSP and sell it, you will get a lower valuation. Secondly, there are anywhere between, I don't know, 80 to 100 private equity firms. 
that have entered the MSP space to be part of the consolidation. It's driving valuations that we had not seen prior to this. What are private equity firms good at? Growing businesses and making money, okay? Mm -hmm. But now, I believe if you are an MSP and you want to contemplate benefiting from the market forces that are at play right now, I would look to sell your business, be part of the next chapter of the journey, put your head down and, and deliver magic in the business that's acquiring you and roll anywhere from 20 to 40% of your equity because it's likely that you will make more money on that, let's average it at 30%, than you made on the 70% if it's growing and if it's, you know, if it's, if it's leveraging the, the economic forces that are at play right now. So I really think the idea of just selling the business and, and exiting is, is, not, uh, is not the right approach. And that's, that's a really interesting perspective that the 30% could make you more than the 70%. And that's simply because um, that 30%, will you, will you technically have a stake in the, in the new parent company then? Yes. So, yes. so walk me through how, like explain like I'm five version. Okay. So how, how does that work? Um, sure. Because you have, you have so many shares of net sure it. And, yes. and when you acquire a company, does that like create new shares or. So you get given shares in the, in the holding, in the total new company. Okay. And. The, the dynamic is as, so hypothetically now, let's assume your business was acquired at a valuation. So EBITDA is your earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation, basically your profit. Mm -hmm. And let's assume the EBITDA multiple you got paid for your business was five times. Okay. So let's assume you were making $100,000. So you got a $500,000 valuation on your business. Okay. okay. And now... You're getting, and I'm just going to simplify things. You get paid out uh, $350,000 in cash, then you roll $150,000. Now, as, as the parent company grows, so does the EBITDA multiple, the profit multiple of the, of the parent company. So if you came in at the valuation. So maybe your business was acquired at five times. The valuation of the parent company is maybe seven or eight times. As that parent company grows, you're going to then attract, it could even go up to a 10 times multiple or a 12 times multiple. So if you just take your $150,000 at 10 times, you know, you could see the maths of it. You've mm -hmm. already, you, you, you've already had a huge impact on, on that valuation. And th there's a great book on this. So I, I was fascinated by private equity. And to be honest, Steve, in the earliest stages of my entrepreneurial life, I thought they were evil. And then I went and read books about it and I didn't kind of grasp it. I, I, I read five or six books and then, and then I read Adam Kofi's book, the private equity playbook. And he just, he does a much better job of explaining it than I just did, but he basically explains how Wherever you can in a deal, take an equity rollover because you're probably going to make as much, if not more money. And what it does is it, it, aligns, it aligns you guys. So now you're focusing in the same direction. You're working towards the same things. And it just, the upside, you all share in the upside and that future. Hmm. Okay. All right. I can get on board with that. I, I do... Uh, in my ignorance, still have that private equity is uh, the big bad boogeyman, right? And and the reason is because I haven't been on the uh, on the vendor side of things, so I don't know what it looks like truly when it, when it, like l let's just throw out some names when a company like Datto gets acquired by Kaseya. I don't really know what happened in that boardroom when, when they did all the negotiating and when they signed the paperwork. I don't really yes. know what happened when they started integrating the two companies. You know, I, I heard what happened on Reddit by somebody who claimed to have worked there, but I'm not, 
I'm, you know, nobody's really sure what, what happened, right? Except for the, the upper management who was involved in that transaction. Yes. But, but when you see a guy like, like Rob Ray, who I assume he had some type of, um, uh, shares, uh, stock options, whatever from, from his tenure at Datto, uh, he joined the Kaseya team. And then I don't know, like, he stuck around and then just kind of disappeared. Yes. And so, so is that, and obviously we're speculating right now. Okay. So sure. I'm just using this as an example. So when, when you see something like that is, is like keeping Rob Ray on board for X number of months going to be part of the acquisition, like making him sign a contract or how how would something like that work? Yeah, so that's that's very look. I don't necessarily have as much experience and insight into the the what ha- is happening in the ecosystem in and around uh, our the MSP community as far as the economics of that. So how those valuations are come to and what the approach is. To- I think when you've got software and IP, maybe the leaders are less critical. But uh, typically what we are looking to do is keep those leaders. And what can happen as well is maybe a year in, so, so hypothetically now you, you, we've done, we bought a business, the key leader stays on, they've rolled equity, okay? Now a year in, they decide, you know what, I haven't spent enough time with my kids. Uh, I, I feel this pressure, I just want to take a break. And then they say, you know what, I want to ease out of, out of this. That can happen, and that's okay, but their equity is still there. <laughs> and and oh, that equity okay. can still, their, their equity doesn't go away. So like I know, I know MSP owners that sold that are not involved in those businesses anymore at all, and they haven't been properly involved in them for two, three years. I mean, we've got, is the initial business we bought in Brooklyn, both of those two shareholders still have shares in their share today. So that's 2016. So that's seven years later. We'll probably go to market to find, find a strategic or private equity partner next year where I, I can tell you now they're going to make much more on that money than they ever made in the initial deal. And look, I mean, we, we obviously had that horrible 2017, 2018, 2019 where we got a whole lot of things wrong. So mm-hmm. sometimes things change, right? You know, and you think, you think it's going to be nice and you think you're going to enjoy it and a year in, it maybe just isn't a fit. And that's okay too because sometimes you go on to do something different. So we're hoping to keep as many of these entrepreneurs as possible, but I, I don't have a lot of knowledge and experience in the other deals in and around our industry, like ConnectWise, Kaseya, SolarWind, these various uh, entities. And, and to clarify, I wasn't asking you for some kind of insider scoop on those deals. I yes. was more or less asking, like, ha- when, when you work on deals for, for when you're making purchases, do you ever have like clauses in the contract that, that stipulate uh, management or, or the CEO needs to stay on board for X number of months because reasons, whatever reasons you want to specify, that's fine. But is, is that something that you, you are able to put in that, in that purchase agreement? Or We've never put that in. Okay. They just stick we, around we, because we, they want to uh, stick around. Yeah, we, we do. We do obviously put language in to prevent them from taking their customers. <laughs> that of course, we def- of that course. we definitely put in. Um, but w- the way we structure the deal is that they have an economic interest in the future success. So we hope they will stay. But sometimes there isn't a fit, and they need and and they want to move on anyway. So yeah, but we don't we don't force them. So when when you're looking to acquire a company. Um, Regardless of what size you are, how, yes. how does, let's, let's skip to the money part. Yes. Um, how, how does a, how does an MSP come up with the financing to purchase a company? Because, uh, typically there's a payout involved with, with that, whether it's for assets or clients or whatever, right? Yes. So is that something that the MSP should have a war chest of, however many millions of dollars in, in a bank account somewhere, or is that a credit line or a, a loan? 
Well, let me start with the typical valuation and then you can, we can kind of reverse engineer it from there and then look at what some of the options are that we've seen. So I think let's assume, um, let's assume a $500,000 MSP in mm -hmm. revenue and let's assume they're making $100,000 um, profit. So let's say that business is then worth $500,000 if you times it by a multiple of five. So typically what that would look like in the types of deals that, that we do is you need to pay probably 60% or more upfront in cash for that business. You need to give them 60% in cash. So now you're talking about $300,000. How do you find $300,000? So it could be a line of credit that you have that uh, is the one. SBA loans are, are another. Um, you could optimize your working capital. So maybe you've got a fair amount of product sales in your business. Everybody talks so negatively about product sales, but I'm telling you now, if you're clever with how you sell product, it, it creates cash. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you negotiate with your supplier for, the, for delayed payment of, say, 60 days, maybe even get, let's say, maybe even get 90 days because you've got a long relationship, great credibility, and then you're getting your customers to pay up front, the quicker you grow from a product sales perspective, the more cash you have. So we've always been very good at the way we manage cash. So that in itself can create cash. Um, Wells Fargo do like floor plans based on the amount of hardware that you sell. Um, there, are, there are various ways of getting, I mean, you could literally pull, pull the money out of your mortgage. Some people are hmm. fully paid up. Some people have still cash left over from you know, some of the support the government gave during COVID and the pandemic. Um, I think you can do it deal by deal. So if you look at the first deal we did in 2016, when we bought that business in Boston, we, we, we just been super frugal with our cash. So we had enough cash reserves. The next deal we did, we leveraged, uh, our bank in South Africa, uh, to, f to, to fund that. And then the second deal we did, Steve, we didn't have the money. <laughs> so we went out to find it. So we ended up running a debt process through an investment bank. And uh, we, like, we, I think there were 100 in the list to start. I think we ended up with three that still wanted to talk to us because we were so small and insignificant. We ended up talking to the company that funded Mark Tyson's comeback fight. And I always wondered to me, why did they tell me they funded Mark Tyson's comeback fight? Was that because in case we didn't pay, then, then we knew they could call Mark Tyson to come get the money from us and the interest rates and what we saw. And then, so we got really expensive money at ridiculous interest rates. And then, and then we went to the market again after that and we found cheaper funding. And then as we've executed on the strategy, it's, it's gotten easier. But you definitely need to have a little bit of a risk appetite. Because if I look at how we ran the business in the past without any debt, like we were debt, like we obsessed with cash and making sure we could pay salaries and that and you need to up your appetite to have a little bit of debt on the, on the balance sheet. Now, someone asked a really great question. Would you consider purchasing an MSP that has no contracts with its clients? All their services are provided month to month. 100%. Okay. <laughs> Does that lower the valuation? I don't think so. I know the private equity firms put huge emphasis on the length of the actual contracts, but you know, for anybody in the MSP industry, I can have you in the most binding contract ever. If I'm not delivering, you're going to fire me. So, so this person that asked this question, if I look at your numbers and I can see you've had this customer for seven years on a month to month, who cares whether it's in a contract? Do you know what I mean? Because the truth of, our, of the MSP industry is, we are measured by the quality of service we deliver. And if I have a binding contract, and we've got binding contracts, and we've let customers out of it where we've dropped the ball, and we've let customers out of it where they've been acquired, we've let customers out of it where they've abused our people, you know, because we fire customers if they treat our people badly. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, like, we, 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 there is no quicker way, I believe, to spread bad word of mouth and create real negativity in the, in the market for yourself if you hold a customer to a contract when you've really gotten it wrong. We had an incident now with a, a well-known marketing provider in our industry. They delivered 50% of what they should have. So we said to them, guys, it's ridiculous. We're a year in. And they got really aggressive. And they said, no, you've signed this contract. You have to. So eventually we said to them, 
I'll go out of my way to tell every MSP I know about how they treated us and how they dealt with it. You know, so that whole contract dynamic, look, the private equity firms and the bigger firms, they want long-term contracts. In my opinion, um, uh, it'll show, it'll show in the numbers because if you list your com- customers and I can see what your churn rate is and you're on month-to-month contract, that's even better than a company that's got long-term contracts and has got the same churn rate, in my opinion, because the customers are not forced to stay. So I had a question and I lost it. Um, now I got it. What advice would you give an MSP who is ready to, to take the leap and be acquired by a company like yours? So I would, I would do a couple of things. Um, I would, I would understand the way valuations work and you can, there's so much information online, all the conferences, you can see it. And, and so that's the one thing. So work out in your mind, you know, because what as MSPs, we get emotional about our business, but like, what will the market pay for my business? So get a realistic view of that. Cause if, if the market will pay five times and you will only do a deal for 12 times, you, it's a non-starter. So get a realistic sense of that. Find a tax advisor to say, I'm an S corp. If I do an asset, if I do, if I do an asset sale or a stock sale, what are the tax options? How does it work? So that the ta- tax, not understanding tax is scuppered deals and uh, literally let, seeing them fall, fall, fall through. So the first is understand valuations. The second is get a good sense of your tax situation. And then, um, I'd say if you're not the sole shareholder, whoever the other shareholders are, make sure they're on board with exploring it. Make sure they're, they're on board. Uh, because what, what can happen is you could get excited, go down the line, and then you kind of bring in this minority shareholder to talk to them about it later, and it turns into a real problem. Um, so those would be, those would, probably the last one, Steve, would be go and talk to potential acquirers that, that you think there's a cultural fit. Go look at their website. Go look on LinkedIn, see what their staff tenure is. There's, you can see that on LinkedIn. Go and see, do they, is there a similar alignment of culture? And that's always a good place to start. And then what advice would you give to MSPs that are looking to make acquisitions? They want to make their first one. So to see, see who in your, I, I think, you know, if I think it's just the demographic that you explained, I would look. I would go to peer groups, see if you can start sourcing possible opportunities there, have a couple of conversations, understand the valuation side as well. What are you going to pay? Okay. And then look at your access to capital in and around that. So once you understand the access to capital you have, you can then define the criteria of the size of deal that you can look at. And then that can guide the conversations that you have. And then again, I would say, look for culture fit. All right. I've got um, one last question on my end. Uh, yes. If anybody has any other questions, please put them in the chat now before we wrap up. Um, do you have your own exit strategy in mind with NetSure? So, yeah, it's, it's, it, the word exit always kind of, I think it carries the wrong message. So we want to find a, a strategic or private equity partner to take us to the next level. So we've got a view of um, the size of business we can build and we want to build one of the best in class MSP platforms. So next year we will find either a private equity or a strategic partner and we will take some cash off the table and hopefully roll between 30 to 40% of the equity. And then in six, four, between four and six years from there, do it again and roll the equity again. So. 30 to 40% of the 30 to 40% that I rolled, I will roll and take more cash off the table. And I'd like to carry on doing this either until I get fired or I'm not enjoying it. You know, those are the two things because I love this space. I love what I do. And, uh, you know, I, I suppose if you're not enjoying it anymore, then that's when you, when you really want to stop. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Well, hey, Oren, thank you so much for coming on here and, and sharing your insights with us today. Um, 
It, this has been awesome, man. I, I learned a lot. Uh, hopefully other MSPs have learned something too. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I really enjoyed the discussion. Awesome. Uh, is there is there anything that that you're looking for today? Like, you know, obviously you're you're here because you're you're looking to uh, spread spread your arms out and and be known a little, right? So, yes. is there is there something you're looking for today? Look, you know, I I'm such a loyal and uh, I, I I feel connected to this community. And, and, and if I can, if I've shared anything that was of any value, that for me feels really good. Um, maybe one thing that uh, for anybody that's listening, if you're aware of any, um, doesn't necessarily have to be an MSP, but any smaller businesses in our space that have the Microsoft Adoption and Change Management Advanced Specialization, and these can be from five people to 10 people organizations, um, we're definitely looking to partner with organizations that have the Microsoft Advanced um, Specialization for change management and adoption. So maybe in your networking, th those would be people training on Office 365 and how to adopt it in the organization. So we're looking for, for, for organizations that do that and focus on that. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for being here on the show. Uh, guys, I, I hope you will attend next week as well. On the uh, on the thirtieth, I have Matt and Kevin joining me from Channel Program, and we are going to talk about their cool new platform called Navistack. Um, oh, look! One last question: What is the multiple of cash flow recommended to pay an MSP with around five hundred thousand in cash flow? I think I think it depends on the profit. On yeah, the EBITDA, right? Yeah. Yeah. So again, in that example, if the company is making $100,000 that you want to acquire, you can probably evaluation anywhere between $400,000 to $600,000. So let's assume it's five hundred. dollars I think you need to have $300,000 approximately to put down. Perfect. All right. Well, hey, everybody. I hope you all have a good one and I will catch you next week on the next live stream. Take care, guys.